All right, so as you saw by the title, today I'm gonna to teach you how to take pictures like a pro. We'll see, how, we'll see how it goes. I don't really know if it's... So I've been wanting to make this video for a while. I know there's a lot of people out there that may have a camera but don't really know how to use it to the best of its abilities. And that's the purpose of this video today. I'm gonna to try to teach you some things you maybe you didn't know that will hopefully make you a better photographer. So the first thing you need to know is that there's three major components to every picture you take. Those are shutter, aperture, and ISO. Once you know what shutter, aperture, and ISO do and how they affect your pictures, then you will have complete control over every situation that you'll be taking photos in. And all three of these things are adjustable within your camera settings. Also you need to know that shutter, aperture, ISO revolve around one major component and that is light. Without light we can't get an image. Always keep in mind that in every situation more light is better because you can always underexpose with your settings. Alright, so let's start with aperture. When you think of aperture, the thing that should come to your mind is depth of field. Now, I'm gonna talk about depth of field in just a moment, but first, I wanna physically show you what aperture is on your camera. Now, the aperture is actually located on the lens. It's actually a mechanism within the lens, I don't know if you can see this, that opens and closes. Now, let's go back to depth of field. Depth of field is basically what is in focus and what is out of focus. So when you use your aperture on your camera, you're basically affecting the blurriness of what's in the background of your subject. And I'll show you picture examples of all of these as we progress. The way aperture is displayed on your camera, it's shown in a range of numbers, typically from f2.8 to f22. Now some lenses can even go lower than 2.8 or higher than f22, depending on how nice or what kind of lens you're using. So you also may be thinking, why is he putting an f before the number? So your aperture is measured in what's called an f-stop. So each number setting is measured by a stop of light. And so that's where the term f-stop comes from. So if you ever hear f-stop, that person is talking about your aperture. The smallest aperture that your camera or lens goes to will be the widest setting that you have. And it's the completely opposite for the highest number setting you have. So if you're at an f2.8, the aperture is gonna be much wider than an f22. One very important thing I forgot to mention with aperture is that it affects the amount of light that is coming into your camera and hitting your camera sensor. You'll see why this is important in a little bit. So let's move on to examples of what aperture can do. So typically, photographers that shoot portraits, weddings, senior photos and such will shoot at their widest aperture setting because that's gonna give them that more professional or that more blurry effect to what's in the background. People will use that setting so that all your attention goes to what's in focus and nothing else. And it looks more majestic and beautiful and blah blah blah. And so here's an example of a wide aperture setting or a shallow depth of field. Now you're probably thinking, now why would I want to use my smallest aperture setting? What's that going to do for me if the widest setting is going to look more majestic and beautiful? Well, now I would say you're typically going to use that higher aperture setting for when you're shooting landscapes. Because what it's going to do when you shoot at a higher aperture is it's going to create a deeper depth of field. So everything that's within the frame will be in focus. And now again, that's great for landscapes because you want to see as far as you can within what you're shooting. And here's an example of a deep depth of focus. Now let's move on to shutter. Your shutter is the mechanism within your camera body that covers your camera sensor and opens and closes to let more or less light in. You see a theme here? To physically show you, your shutter is the thing that does this. Fun fact, uh, I actually have film in here so I just wasted an exposure on this so I hope you guys like this video. Like and subscribe down below. Now on your camera you can adjust the speed of your shutter and what that affects is the amount of light that is hitting your sensor. Your shutter is also shown by a range of numbers and this is where it can get a little confusing. So these range of numbers are shown in fractions of a second on your camera. Now typically most cameras I think can hold their shutter as long as 10 seconds. And now on the opposite side of that range, most cameras can open and close their shutter as fast as an 8,000th of a second. 
At least, I think that's what my camera goes to. Yours may be different. Now, when you think of shutter, the thing that should come to your mind on top of how much light it's letting in is motion blur. I would say motion blur is the main purpose of your shutter. Now, what do I mean by motion blur? For example, let's say you're shooting skateboarding or some sort of action sports. Typically, whenever you're shooting whatever sport that may be, you want to freeze that action. Now, let's just take skateboarding, for example. Say you're shooting someone skating and they're in the air. Now, most of the time, you don't want them blurry. You want to freeze them in midair. So it looks like they're frozen in midair. In order to do this, you're going to use a faster shutter speed. So for example, one eight thousandth of a second because it's a smaller measurement of a second. I hope that makes sense. It gets a little confusing because the, the shutter speed may look like a larger number, but it's actually a smaller fraction. And so here's an example of a fast shutter speed and what it can do. So on the opposite end of that, you would use a slow shutter speed for creating motion blur. I think a good example of this is when you see pictures of like a waterfall or an ocean and it looks completely smooth. Those people used a longer shutter speed so that it created motion blur to give that smooth look. There's so many ways to use a long shutter speed, but here's an example of what a long shutter speed looks like. Alright, so the last component we're going to talk about is ISO. ISO is simply the sensitivity of your camera sensor. ISO is also measured in a range of numbers. Typically the lowest is 100 and they can go all the way up to, I mean nowadays they go 2000s, but mine goes to 6400 or 6400. So basically the lower the ISO number, the less sensitive your sensor is to light. And the complete opposite with a higher ISO number, it's more sensitive to light. Now, I like to think of ISO as a crutch in the sense that it's there when you absolutely need it. Why I say that is because the higher your ISO goes, the more noise and grain you'll see on your image. And it produces a less clean image than what you would get with a low ISO number. Think of it this way. When you're shooting outside during the day, you always want your ISO at the lowest number possible. The time when you're really going to want to use a high ISO number is when those moments when you're shooting at dusk or at night and your aperture is all the way wide open and your shutter is as slow as it can go before it becomes shaky or you see blur that you don't want to see. And then that is the moment when you want to bump up your ISO to give you more light. Just so you can see what it looks like, here's an example of a high ISO with a lot of grain. All right, to finish up this video, I want to tell you how these three things, shutter, aperture, and ISO, all work together. Depending on the lighting situation that you are in, you are going to adjust all three of these things accordingly to properly expose your image. For example, you're doing portraits and you want that shallow depth of field, that majestic look but you're shooting in the middle of the day. Now, in order to shoot your aperture wide open and get that blurry effect, you're going to want to shoot at a very low ISO with a fast shutter speed. Let's say you're shooting at dusk or at night. In this case, you're probably gonna to wanna to open your aperture as wide as you can so that you have as much light coming in, as well as you're probably going to have to shoot at a slower shutter speed than you would like. But be careful with this. One thing I was taught was never to shoot at a shutter speed lower than 1 60th of a second. At that point, if you're shooting without a tripod, it's really hard to create no motion blur that just looks shaky and unintentional. And with this low light setting you're shooting in, you're probably going to have to bump up your ISO to a higher number. As I'm editing this video, I just wanted to end it by saying the best advice I can give to any person who's starting out with photography is to just go out and shoot as much as you can. Go out, take your camera off auto and put it on manual and mess with your shutter, aperture, and ISO. Play around with different lighting situations and mess around with the settings and see what you come up with. I hope this video was helpful. I hope it wasn't too boring. Um, if you want to see more like this, please let me know in the comments. Thank you.